everyone. How are we doing? Happy Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. Uh, we have the chat function happening here. Feel free to introduce yourselves. Let us know where you're joining us from and what you're using to cheers to our Olympic bronze medalist in the marathon. Molly Seidel is here with us tonight. This is so exciting. Oh, um, this is water, not vodka. Um, playing it cool. Molly Seidel is here. Hello, hello, hello. How are you? Sorry, I'm just getting established. I'm trying to find the right spot for my iPad over here. I literally just got back to Flagstaff. Amazing. That was going to be one of my questions. Where in the world is Molly Seidel? So I am currently in Flagstaff as of about two hours ago. We had some massive delays coming back in. But um, yes, I'm very glad to be, uh, be, be back here. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, before we get into all of the good stuff, I first just want, well, hi, I'm, I'm Allie Feller from the Allie on the Run show. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. I think this is the best way possible to spend a Tuesday night. There's nowhere I would rather be. Uh, thank you to Picky Bars. Picky Bars is the best and the coolest to work with. Uh, I sent them a text like right after Molly crossed the finish line. It was like, yo, we should do a live show with Molly and her parents and her cousins and her whole family. And they were like, okay. Uh, so just big thanks to Sarah and Julia and the whole team over there for making this happen. Uh, thank you to all of you for being here. But most importantly, Molly, thank you for being here fresh thank off the plane. And thanks for winning an Olympic bronze medal and inspiring <laughs> all of us. That felt, you know, it felt like it was for us. So thank you for doing that. It's been, it's been truthfully just like absolutely wild. Like I, I feel like it still hasn't fully sunk in. Like I'll hold the medal and still kind of be like, oh my God, like this actually happened. Can we see it? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm up at my desk. So I've got all my fun um, Olympic memorabilia up here. I just happen to have, I don't, I don't usually just carry all my stuff with me. Did you I've wear, do you wear it on the plane and everything? I, I should at this point now. Oh yeah. Well, so I assume you don't pack it in your luggage, right? It goes in your carry on lest yeah. your luggage get lost. So does it set off the metal detector? Like that's, that's gonna no, be I wish though, because that would be like the best, like coming through security of like, Oh, sorry. It's just my Olympic medal. Yeah. But no, I, I like, trust me, I'm not that bad. Uh, not yet, but, um, here okay, we've got, all right, here we go. Right. An Olympic medal. I know. Isn't that wild? It's really heavy too. It? It's like, weirdly got like some thickness to it. Like, you know what it is. So when they gave it to you, did they give you like handling instructions, like polish it every day with a damp cloth? <laughs> did they teach you like, no, how do you they, get for an Olympic medal? They just give it to you straight. And so I've heard some horror stories. So I was, um, I was just hanging out last night with some of the people from Trek in my hometown. A lot of people work at Trek, the bicycle company. And so one of their gold medalists in mountain biking, apparently, I don't know what happened, but something got on the metal and they tried to use a material to like wipe it off. And it literally started peeling the coating off of her gold metal. It was gold. I was going to ask. It was literally gold because it's gold plated silver. And so the gold started like peeling off. It was so bad, like so, so bad. Maybe she can get a new one. That's what Maybe I've heard. I've heard that they'll replace them if something really like tragic happens to it. Wow, that is tragic. Um, also, one thing that I forgot to mention, um, and uh, this is, I'm just too excited. Um, I did want to thank everyone too. Uh, I'm sure you all know because you're here, but 100% of the proceeds from tonight are going to the Brave Like Gabe Foundation. Um, so far we have raised more than $4,500 for Brave Like Gabe, which is an organization that was founded by Gabe Grunewald. She was a professional runner, an incredible inspiration. And sadly she passed away um, from a rare cancer two years ago. And the Brave Like Gabe Foundation, that's what they do. They raise money and awareness for rare cancers. And um, to add tragedy to tragedy, um, Gabe's sister uh, was killed just a few weeks ago. And so that's especially why um, this is an organization we always love to support. But um, the loss of Abby was just beyond tragic. And so we're, of course, sending love out to the Anderson family and the Grunewald family and everyone affected by that. So um, I just really wanted to thank you all. Um, it was donation optional. And so many of you chose to leave like 
the highest amount, which is just so cool. So thank you all for your generosity. It's, it just, um, warms my heart to know that, um, this is all it's, it's fun and we're going to have a great time, but also that it is going to a good cause. Um, okay. Molly is your arm sore from throwing out the first pitch at the Red Sox game? Like how does the soreness of the arm compare to the soreness of the legs in a marathon? Sadly, I wish it was sore because I didn't throw hard enough. I like, and that's that's the thing I do. No, I didn't make it to home plate. And that was the thing. Like, I actually am pretty good at throwing a baseball. And I had been practicing beforehand. And I, I, I caved, I, I choked. So how does that work? Like, did you just get a call one day being like, hi, it's the Red Sox. Would you like to throw the first pitch? And you're like, I've been practicing for this my whole life game time. (laughs) No. So what happened is we got back to Boston. So I flew, I got back from Tokyo. I was in flag for a couple days. And then I flew right to Boston to do Falmouth um, for the charity run that we did. And so the original like Olympians recognition day was the day of Falmouth. So I was like, guys, like, I'm so sorry. I physically can't do this. I'm doing a run for charity down on the Cape. And they're like, oh, that's fine. Do you want to just come back on Friday and you'll throw the first pitch? I'm like, let me check my calendar. Sure. Um, But yeah, it was absolutely wild but no I had not I had not thrown anything in a good long while so I definitely spent a couple days like in our backyard like you throwing things against the fence and I thought I was so ready I even warmed up with like the ball girl because I was nervous and then I was so worried that if I threw it too hard it was gonna like splice like a who is that that did that like like 50 cent or something like oh yeah completely the wrong way so I underthrew. And at least it went straight, but it bounced. Well, I thought it looked good. I mean, not a ball sports athlete over here, but I thought it looked great. Well, see, that's as a runner, I can get away with that. Like, I feel like with most other sports, you'd be like, come on. At least with this, they're like, it's fine. She's a runner. (laughs) Did home plate look really far away when you were standing on the mound? Yeah, it was like everything's got suddenly got a lot bigger. Uh, and I suddenly realized just how big Fenway is. But yeah, it is it was it was really freaking cool. Like that was that was just absolutely incredible. I just love all the cool stuff that you get to do when you like win a major marathon or win an Olympic medal, like all the bonus stuff that you maybe never thought about doing is cool. Also, uh, we need to hear the airplane story because everyone is talking oh my about God. this airplane story. Um, oh my God. Has a, tw- okay, has a tweet say- ever gotten that much, that many likes? Last I checked, it had 60,000 likes. That's what I thought that was crazy because I don't tweet. Like even John, my coach, he was like, wait, you tweeted. And I'm like, <laughs> I know, but that's the thing. When something is like, frankly, batshit crazy as this happens, I was just like, I just have to like, put this out into the world because this is insane but yeah basically I was flying back from Boston to Wisconsin I had just moved out um and I'm sitting next to this guy on the plane and just to clear the air because I know it's been now a big discussion online it was 100% mansplaining like without a doubt like this guy was not a nice guy he was oh. not just like, a, he, no, it was not that kind of thing. Cause if he had been just like a genuinely friendly, like, I'd like, I'm a fairly, like, I love meeting people. I love talking to people. If someone is just even vaguely nice, I'm like, sure. Yeah. Let's have a conversation. This guy was horrible. Like, okay. So wait, like, so what happens? So you sit down on the plane and you're masked. I assume I if sit you're down on a plane. plane, I'm wearing, I'm wearing like a low mm-hmm. hat. I'm wearing a mask. Also, because when I'm racing, I'm either wearing sunglasses or I'm squinting. So most people don't know what my eyes actually look like. So yeah, like I'm unrecognizable on the plane. This guy is sitting next to me and you can immediately tell like, oh God, he's a talker. Um, And starts basically just going off, like tooting his own horn about how he is this like like he's an Ironman triathlete he's a running coach he's the running guru that's figured out the secret to running basically and it comes up that I'm a runner as well um and basically he just starts without like any sort of thing just starts telling me like what I need to do in my training blah 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 and basically says like the secret to training is high mileage like have you heard about this one runner? She just won bronze and she runs 130 miles a week. I'm like, sir, like, why are you telling a stranger to run 130 miles a week? That is 
the dumbest thing. That's barely healthy for me. Like, <laughs> yeah. And then on his phone, he pulls up an Excel spreadsheet of what looks to be just my Strava that he put into an Excel spreadsheet. And he's saying, I've done an analysis of many pros training and like, and my training was one of the pros that he had on there. And I just, more than anything, it was just equal parts condescending, but also super creepy. And I just didn't want to have to go there. Of well, so like, that's what I, how did you not just like hold up the metal? Also, just pro tip for next time, wear the metal through security, no. get yourself an well, upgrade, girlfriend. No, get yourself yeah, it. Yeah. front of the plane. No, but that's <laughs> the thing is like, in those situations, like, especially like I was feeling actually like mega creeped out. Yeah. And so I was like, I don't want this dude to know that that's me. Like, cause there are a lot of other times where like, even on the flight back from Tokyo, I sat next to a kid, he was like a college runner and he like looked over, he was like, wait, are you that girl that just won? I was like, yeah. And he was like, can I see the medal? I'm like, hell yeah. And I just like, given the medal he's like snapchatting all his college teammates and like and so that kind of stuff is fun and that's actually cool to like get to bond with people over that this guy was just like oh just the worst wow was it alberto salazar oh god yeah. <laughs> you, i know he had a mask on but maybe he would have told me that i need to change my form which i've actually had another guy there was seriously a guy he reached out to my coach and was like, Molly's form is not good. If you changed her form, she could be a 210 marathoner. And my coach is just like, okay, this man's crazy. No, this man then oversteps my coach and sends a packet to my parents of photographs of me, like saying how I need to change my running form so I can be a 210 marathoner. Like some of the stuff is crazy that we've gotten. Yeah, well- if he's in here, I mean, there's a couple hundred people. If he's watching this, <laughs> reveal yourself. We have yeah, please, questions. please, man's announce yourself if you're here. Wow, that is wild. Well, I mean, it was the the tweet seen around the world. Uh, you no, know, I'm amazed how much traction that picked up. Like, but yeah, just to clear the air, this guy was not a nice guy. If he had been a nice guy, I would have had no problem introducing myself. But yeah, it was just like, oh. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, sorry. It's not the most like fun, positive spin on. No, it, we're but... going to do that. We're going to have so much fun, positive stuff. Um, okay. So a couple, couple quick questions to get this started, uh, started. We're like 20 minutes. Yeah. In, this is how we do things. Um, now that you're back in Flagstaff where you mm -hmm. will be living for most yep. of the time, any thoughts about where you will put that metal? Are we thinking tucked away in a sock in the nightstand or hanging on the wall box frame around your neck at all times? Like, like yeah. some people train with a weight vest. So it could be like I that. had thought about hanging it from the rear view mirror in my car, but then <laughs> I'm mask. worried if I stop too hard, that it'll smash the windshield because it or is you really or me. Um, yeah, I don't know. I kind of want to hang it in just like a random spot in the house because I will have like, I have two extra bedrooms in my house. So I rent out the other rooms. I have people come to stay all the time. So I would love it if someone just like comes to stay in like randomly, like in their closet. It's just like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> love that. Um, okay. Quick game of true or false. Mm -hmm. um, true or false. You brought googly eyes to stick on stuff in the Olympic village. <laughs> that is 100% true. <laughs> Let's hear more about that. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> we brought a packet of googly eyes and so we just wanted to like mess with people like truly we had a lot of fun over at the olympics and my coach and i are just at our core absolute goons so we would stick them on the hotel doors we had really big ones so those one went on the doors we would put them on like um like condiment jars and stuff so like a ketchup bottle little googly eyes we put them on signs we just wanted people to be going around and being like what the hell are all these googly eyes for yeah we're we're seventh graders at the end of the day with no, our humor it's joyful but where did you think of that like I would never think to do that and I'm a pretty silly person but that would never cross my mind I, know. I just I feel like googly eyes never get old like I love that Googly eyes are always funny like That's true I'm inspired yeah, yeah I'm inspired. the Canadians brought a giant like full-size moose like a moose statue to put in front of their thing so yeah of course the moose got googly eyes love that um and I know this was coming up in the chat before we officially started but um 
Callum Hawkins, has he responded to you? And oh. can, can you give us that story a little bit? You shot, okay. you shooting your shot. Yeah. That story is that I have a huge crush on Callum Hawkins. And on a previous podcast with um, my friend, David Melly, he had asked me who my running celebrity crush was. And I said that it was Callum Hawkins. Apparently the Brits have now seen this. I'm friends with a lot of the British runners, but the British guys gave Callum Hawkins so much crap about that, that he was too embarrassed to even look at me in the village. Like it broke my heart. So I shot my shot today. Nothing will probably come of it. My heart is broken. It's so he hard. hasn't responded. He has not responded. It's okay. He might. I'm not sad. I'm heartbroken, but <laughs> it's okay. We're, we're oceans apart. It would have never worked anyway. It might have. We just need to make sure that the next time you get on a flight, we vouch, uh, we vet who's sitting around you. Yeah, um, exactly. For those long distance relationship flights. We'll work on that. Um, maybe, you know, it would be a good sponsor is a private jet company. Oh, I actually had someone reach out to me like in my DMs, but they were like, we would love to be your private jet sponsor for $400,000 if you pay us. I'm like, you pay them. I don't think I'm like, what do you think pro runners make? (laughs) Like, ma'am, ma'am, I've got status on United. I don't need that life. (laughs) I've got a lot of frequent flyer miles at this point. (laughs) Also not how sponsorship works. Usually it's the reverse, but yeah, you Usually you don't have to pay them. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I do want to hear, and I'm sure everyone else does, like every detail of th- leading up to the race, the race itself, the aftermath. Um, I actually want to go back to the track and field trials because that's when mm-hmm. you went out to Eugene to pick up all your stuff, right? Yeah. All the Team USA. So tell us about that because for you, it was such a long time coming. The marathon trials have been a full year and a half prior. So this had been a really long build for you. What was it like finally getting to go out to Eugene oh. and pick up all the gear? Did that make it feel real if it didn't yet? Well, so that was, yeah, it was so cool getting to like fly out there one, see the new stadium out there, which is wild. Um, but yeah, just like going through processing, like it just felt like our world was on hold for such a long time that going out and like getting all the gear and like getting it. So I did my processing with Alephine. And so like, cause Sally hadn't come in yet. Um, we, it was just like being there feeling like, oh my God, like this is really happening. We're making our flights. We're getting this. So it was so exciting. But at the same time at the processing, we started to find out just how strict things were going to be. Like we knew it was going to be strict, but that's when we were finding out like, oh, we're not going to have really good training facilities. Oh, we're going to be like pretty strictly quarantined. Like at that time, Alphine didn't think that she was going to be able to bring her baby Zoe. And so it was this really exciting experience, but then at the same time, it almost was tempered. Like for Alphine, it was a really hard experience. And so, and we were like, kind of like finding out more and more like, okay, this isn't going to be necessarily the Olympic experience that we imagined, but like, we're going to adjust and we're going to adapt and we're going to make the most of it. But I mean, like seriously, just getting to be there and feel like, okay, wow. Like we're actually going, that was just like, it was crazy. And how much racing did you get to watch while you were at the trials? Did you get to kind of stick around and watch some races or was it like in and um, out? Got oh, my no, bag? Actually none. Yeah. None? I wasn't even allowed to go into the uh, stadium. Oh, at all. Yeah. Well, because oh. so the, they didn't give us tickets when we went out, we didn't have passes to get in. And I like, I love track. However, I'm not going to pay $120 to get into that stadium when I already pay for the streaming services to watch track. <laughs> so I watched a lot of my friends in their prelims for the 15 from my hotel room. Oh my gosh. There's, yeah, I feel like you with ATF. <laughs> yeah. There's something wrong with that. Someone needs to get a phone call or, you know, wait, do you see that the chat is blowing up with people saying <laughs> that Callum is running the New York city marathon? Wait, what? Oh, you didn't know that. <laughs> Oh shit. <laughs> See, now this guy's just going to think I'm a stalker that I'm like following. He's like, this American keeps us trying. He, <laughs> he's coming to you. He's coming to us soil. That's, that's exactly why he's running New York. He's just like, man, that, that American with the cereal box body. Oof. Got to get by her. <laughs> cereal box body. I've never heard that. <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> 
Um, well, just saying, I'll, you know, the athletes are often at, put up at the same hotel. They're at a lot of the same events. So just, um, well, I'll invite him out to love. Yeah. What's something like I'll invite him out to coffees and bagels and hope he doesn't get hit by a taxi. Oh my God. That took such a turn <laughs> at the end. <laughs> at that, no, that's the thing. Every time I go to New York, I swear to God, I almost get hit by a taxi every single time. Like it's like clockwork. One of these times it's going to happen. No, I don't like that. I don't want that to happen. Can we <laughs> see that in bubble wrap there? <laughs> All right. Whoever is traveling with you, um, to New York, can you just keep her firmly on the sidewalk? Just At least body, block body, body block. block. I saw yes. someone in the chat say that we need to go on a date to Duncan and I yes. will support that. Yeah, that's cute. Allie on the run singled out with uh, with Molly and Callum. I love that. Um, okay. So how was the travel over to Tokyo? What did you do on the flight to stay entertained? Um, so I have a lot of trouble sleeping on flights. So I just read almost the entire flight. Um, I just like loaded up my iPad, got a bunch of books on, on the Kindle or like the Kindle app and just like read the whole flight over, but no, it was so comfy. I got the upgrade. So I was like, I was like, I feel like luxurious after that. Like it seriously made the flight. I, I don't know if I can go back. I don't know if I can go back to how the other half lives. No, what I, I want to be like, once you go first class, you never go back, but I've flown first class like once and I have gone back. Yeah. And that's I every flight since I've, <laughs> yeah. Every single one of my flights since then has just been coach. I'm like, yeah back, back yeah. where I belong. Here but I no, am. It was great while it lasted. It was so nice. Um, but yeah, the flights were incredible. I got to put my legs up, came off the plane feeling really good. Um, and yeah, then we got like, I was super messed up with my sleep schedule though. So I'm glad that we had a couple days, like, um, like leading into it. So, okay. Well, first, what kind of books were you reading? Are we talking like get your head in the game type of books? Oh, like oh, mindset, no, or, like, I literally romance can't novels? read running. No, I can't read running books. My whole life is running. I don't need to consume running content. Everyone tells me to watch running movies and read running books. And I just want something different. Um, but no, I, I like like literature. I read a Haruki Murakami book. Um, which is one of my favorite ones. I did wind up bird chronicle on the way over. Um, and on the way back, I did Atlas shrugged, um, because Whoa. everyone's been, I know, well, just because it's so some light big. reading. For- no, well, because it's so big and I really like the fountainhead. Um, yeah, it's a little like conservative for me, but I don't know. I liked it. It was, it's interesting. It's wow. a, at the very least, it's a, like kind of a big doorstop to get through. <laughs> Wow. Love that for you. So you Mm -hmm. flew to Tokyo. As we know, the marathon was in Sapporo, um, that 500 miles North, cause it was going to be cooler there. Uh, (laughs) yeah, we'll get to that. Uh, but what was it like getting to Tokyo and sort of arriving and being around all the fanfare and how long were you there? Kind of walk us through the Tokyo part of it. Yeah. So we flew in and we had to spend about three to four hours in customs, just getting through the airport. Um, just because it was like, basically the protocol going through was like your COVID tested. You have to go through all these hoops. They have like 15 handlers managing you through the airport. If you try to go anywhere, they're like stopping you. Let's um, get them for when you're in New York to keep you away from the taxis. Exactly. Perfect. I just need my Japanese body blockers. Yes. Um, and then it's about an hour drive from the airport to the village. And then we got to the village like late. Um, and the village is so cool. Like, it's like just, it's these big like housing blocks and all the housing blocks are different countries. Everybody's got like their decorations and flags up. There's like a big dining hall in the middle. It's right on Tokyo Bay. And so we got in like in the middle of the night and I of course couldn't sleep. So I went for a run around the village at like 3 a.m. And there's people out partying. I was going to ask, were other people out doing stuff? Oh yeah. People are out at all hours of the night. And so, yeah, they were like partying on the little grass area. So I went for a run. I called my mom. I went to the dining hall at like 4 a.m. Um, but yeah, it was super cool because we got to be there for like two days. Um, and it was really nice linking up with a lot of my friends who were running track and just like getting to see them. Um, and then they shipped us up to Sapporo. So Ali or uh, yeah, Alephine and Sally got in we went for a run and they shipped us right up to Sapporo. 
And Sapporo was very different. It was, we were basically quarantined in a hotel for the full week. It was not as fun as the village. So when you were in Tokyo, did you have a roommate in the athlete village or were you by yourself? So it, my roommate was Alphine, but because okay. she got in later than me, I like had my room or I had the room to myself on my little cardboard bed. Um, yeah. <laughs> they actually weren't that bad. Like they were better than I expected them to be. They just look so small. And I mean, you're small, but I think, yeah, about, like, would Michael well, Phelps fit in that bed? He'd probably So get, apparently like, for the bed. throwers, Nectar sent out like larger beds for them. So that was pretty cool. But yeah, for me, we were barely on them. Like I only slept on it for like two days on the front end and two days on the back end. And like, I don't know, it like, it was fine. It was a cardboard bed. (laughs) And did you get to watch any events while you were there? No, we weren't allowed to go into the stadium. Wow. Okay. So they, they shipped you up to Sapporo. Uh, Were you just on like a regular commercial flight there? Because it's not close. It's 500 miles. No. So they booked out a full, like, yeah, a full airplane as like a charter to take all the athletes up there. Um, and the question was whether or not my coach John was going to be able to get up there because they were not allowed on that same flight. And so him and Mike Smith, um, who's, um, uh, it's Galen coach, but also one of my good friends from Flagstaff, they were considering just like breaking out and trying to like drive up the country, like, yeah, break cool. quarantine and just get up to Sephora. I was like, John, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> but um, needless to say, they did make it up on their own charter flight. But yeah, basically they booked out an entire commercial flight and just put the athletes on us, got us up to Sapporo, And then they just took us right to this hotel. And we stayed in that hotel for the entire week, um, except for our prison yard time when we got to go run around the concrete loop. <laughs> oh my gosh. So did it feel like, we were just in the center of it all. And then like a come down or was it nice of like, Hey, now we're here and we can focus. What did it feel like? I think it definitely made it feel much more like if anything, I think it helped take some of that pressure away of like, cause it almost didn't feel as much like the Olympics of like, Oh, this is just another race. And like, it just felt like it felt like that feeling of like the night before the race, but like for the entire week. Um, and so, yeah, it definitely helped for focusing in. And I guess it was a lot quieter. The beds were nicer because um, we got our own hotel room and the hotel was really nice. So, yeah, it was like I hung out like we were able to hang out a little bit with other countries. So, like, I hung out with some of my friends on the Brit or the UK team with some of my friends on the Australian team um, and then with Alphine and Sally. But for the most part, it was pretty isolating. OK, so tell us about the night before the race. What is Molly Seidel's pre-marathon meal? Pre-marathon meal. We, we went to the dining hall. Um, it was pretty simple foods the whole time. So I had. They did, they had sweet potatoes that night. So I think I just had sweet potato and, um, really dry salmon. Um, Mm. (laughs) that's usually kind of my go-to. I usually either do like rice and fish or potatoes and fish. So it worked out just fine. Um, but midway through dinner, we found out that they moved the race up an hour. So we like hightailed it out of there and like got to bed. And I was like low key hyperventilating a little, it takes a lot to like, really like sway me. I'm usually pretty chill before races. Um, and I was freaking out a little bit. (laughs) What was it that freaked you out? Was it, I'm going to get one less hour of sleep or like, this is just now sooner. What was it that got to you? I think it was a combination of those two. It was just like one, it was the one less hour of sleep. It was like waking up at 3 AM, um, which like you don't sleep the night before a race. That shouldn't have been a problem. I think it was more just like, Oh my God, like the world is chaos right now. And luckily John, my coach was there. And so we were just like hanging out in the room, like getting things ready. And he was just like, just remember this, like, doesn't change anything. Like you're just still going to go race. And I'm like snapping at him a little bit. Cause I'm like, this is not the same. Um, but yeah, I, I really appreciated ha- having him there, but yeah, it, I just started like at one point I just like burst out laughing and he's like, why are you laughing? I'm like this entire, like getting to the line of this marathon has been the biggest shit show of all time. We went through a global pandemic. We went through a full quarantine. We went through all of this nonsense. And now less than 12 hours before the race, they moved the start time up an hour. This is just like the cherry on top of the icing on top of the cake. 
<laughs> like it was I, just yeah I, I but like it worked out just fine I'm glad that they moved it up it, it worked was, out great for you oh yeah I mean, it worked out great <laughs> Well, I mean, actually, low-key, I was hoping that it was just as hot and miserable as possible because that was my only chance of doing well in that race. (laughs) Okay, tell us more about that and about why you think that. So I had done a lot of heat and humidity training going into that race. Like, I felt like, and I naturally just run very well in the heat. Um, I knew based on the Kenyans there and just how many really good women were there, the worse the conditions were, the more it was going to equalize out that race. So if the conditions had per- been perfect, no chance I would have stayed, been able to stay with those women. Like Bridget Koska, I almost lapped me at London. Like, let's be serious here. Um, but I knew that if things were really, really, really tough and it, if it got really hot, they weren't going to go out as fast. And so that I had more of a chance of staying with the pack longer, the more miserable it got. Um, because at the end of the day, I'm a psychopath and I can like handle a lot of like really bad conditions. So I was just like praying that it was as miserable as possible. And luckily we got miserable. (laughs) And how much of that is physical because your body just performs well in that. Like you said, you train in a lot of that. And how much of that is mental of like, I like this challenge. I look at you know, the three marathons that you've done, Molly, mm-hmm. not great weather. Atlanta was cold and so windy. London, mm-hmm. you had rain. Uh, mm-hmm. And then this was and 8 I million had degrees. Cold times. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. The, the, uh, the post-race uh, clip heard. Yeah. Sure. On, on international television. That was great. Yeah. That's probably why Callum. Fill, 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 like fill everyone in yeah. anyone who didn't hear that. Tell Basically, I had to go to the bathroom so badly the entire marathon. And right after I finished on like BBC, international television, the live stream, I just like, like into the camera, right in my face. I'm like, is there a porta potty? I have to go to the bathroom so bad. Yeah. It, it's relatable it was- though. Like I can't relate to you having a bronze medal, but that, that's the language that, that <laughs> everybody the folks speak. There. Yeah. I guess I worry though that I'm only good at really bad conditions and that I'm going to get into one of these races of like perfect conditions. And I'm just going to like, not do well. And people are going to be like, Oh God, like maybe she should only be in bad condition marathons. Well, you've also never really just run a traditional marathon. All three of yours. I mean, the trials was the trials. London was what 90 loops of that little course. And then, Oh, it was only 19, (laughs) not only 19. I'm so sorry. I miscounted. Uh, and then this one, so you've never really just run, you've never done a point to point course and you've never really Mm -hmm. run a traditional marathon. So, I mean, I know it's going to be fun to watch you at New York. You're going to have to check your bag just so you know, yeah, they transport it to the finish. Wait, really? No, they'll take care of it for you. <laughs> You'll be good. I don't know. But yeah, they, so at, at point to point races, you bring all your stuff to the start and then you give it to someone and they have it for you at the finish. They trust See, I don't trust that because that happened to me at Peachtree and all of my stuff got stolen. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. It won't yeah, happen in New York. It'll be bag. great. It'll be great. Um, New York Roadrunners representatives who are in here, can you please make sure that Molly's bag makes it safely to Tavern on the Green? Thank you so much. Please don't let my stuff get stolen again. It won't. It'll be fine. Um, okay. So you wake up the morning of the race, didn't sleep well. Many of us can relate to that. Uh, walk us through what you were feeling and do you have any pre-race rituals, mantras, routines? What is What does the morning of look like? Yeah. So race morning, we get up, I went, I got a little bit of breakfast, but I, I literally like race mornings. I kind of have to just like shovel food in my mouth because everything tastes like sandpaper. Um, but yeah, basically I just like get coffee in my system as quick as possible, get some peanut butter and toast in my system as quick as possible. And then We had to get all of our stuff in order. John had the presence of mind to bring the podium suit um, which I thought he was being a total idiot at the time, but I guess that worked out. So um, everyone gets one. Is that how that works? Everyone so gets everybody a outfit. Everybody gets your fancy little podium outfit because you have special outfits for everything. You have your outfit for the podium. You have your outfit for closing ceremonies. You have your outfit for showing up to the start line. I don't know. 
but yeah, it comes in its special little like garment bag. And so John is, we're like walking out of the room, like grabs it. I'm like, why are you grabbing that? He's like, we like Tyler said that we need to have one in the tent just in case somebody doesn't, it doesn't have to be for you. It can be for anyone. And in his mind, he's like, yeah, I'm bringing it for Molly. Um, but yeah, I'm like, okay, sure, John. So he brings that we're in, they bus us to the start line and we're in our little tent and I do like a five minute warm up. Um, I'm trying to think the only real thing that I do before I go, I fold all of my warm up clothes before I get to the start line. Um, so like I, I'll take off my warm ups and I've pulled them all up all nicely. Um, but yeah, we had to do ice vests before because it was, even with the hour earlier, it was still pretty hot. So we have like these vests where you literally slide bags of ice into them and it keeps your core temperature like lower. Um, but for the most part, it was just like, there was a lot of different stations. There's a call room at the Olympics. So you go through with your credentials, they check all your stuff and then you have to wait. Then they check your stuff again and you wait again. So it's like a half hour long process. Just get through the call rooms to the start line. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I kind of just roll with it. I've had so many different kinds of times where it's like, it changes every time what your pre-race is. So I try not to have too many like very rigid, like I have to do this now. I have to do this now. Other than warming up for a mile, an hour out from the start, that's about it. Um, but yeah, basically I had been so nervous about like this race not happening or getting pulled for like a COVID close contact that like once I got on the start line, that was like the most like at peace I'd felt in like a long time. I was just like, oh my God, we made it. Like I'm here, I get to do this. I like, I hadn't in my mind been thinking, I like in my mind, I'd been like, I can't call myself an Olympian until I start this race. So when the gun went off and I'm like, no, I get to call myself an Olympian. And then that just like over the course of the next two and a half hours, that just blew right out of the water. And so now I've just moved on to the next step, but yeah, it was cool for that hour and a half to just be able to say that or two and a half hours. Uh, we saw you posted such a funny screenshot before the race of you Googling, like what do marathoners eat during a marathon? Um, yeah. Tell us, was that real? That was real. So it was, in my defense, it was not to eat. So I know exactly, I know my calculations for how many carbs I need per hour. I try to take 50 grams of carbs per hour and I work with Morton. I love that stuff. And so I know exactly how many carbs I need. I do not know my sweat rate and I don't know how much fluid that I need. Fluid. Okay. Because USOPC did not let me come in for sweat rate testing. Um, they basically shut down the whole center. So I was kind of just like guessing and so I was wondering if I needed to take in more fluids than I took in at London and Atlanta. And I came to the conclusion that I didn't. I stuck with what I went with there. And I actually overhydrated a little bit. So I'm glad that I didn't go with more. Um, but yeah, it's just all about like how, what concentrations I do for my Morton, basically. But yes, that is true that the day before the race, while making my bottles, I looked up on Runner's World how much do I need to drink during a marathon? <laughs> Good thing you got through the paywall. I feel like yeah. you posted before being like, I'm at my limit and I want to read this article about me. So that was, I, I luckily had my one article for the month that I was able to do it for. Um, but yeah, if all of you guys, if you think that pros have it figured out, at the very least, I don't. So yeah, any comments, suggestions that you have for my marathon feeling, please send them. Uh, plane guy is going to come out here and start giving you advice. Oh, so don't worry. I had one time at a group run that a guy lambasted me because I, he said that I could run 20 minutes faster if I went keto. And I, I slightly disagree with that one. I'm going to stick with the carbs <laughs> for now, but yeah, I, I appreciate how vehemently he supported keto in my ability to run marathons without you have a whole car. list of people you need to just dangle the medal in in front of <laughs> at this point like you got to start making a list i see um, i don't even think that would make a difference 
No, I don't, I feel like no. that would They'd be like, it could have been gold if, you know, you cut out carbs for 10 Yeah, minutes. they're like, yeah. man, really? You were the second loser. Like, <laughs> no. think how much better you could have done if you were just fat adapted. <laughs> uh, but you did eat. The last thing that you ate before you started running, Picky mm-hmm. Bar's need for seed. Uh, that so is true. Shout out to Picky Bar's. If they, I wonder if this has happened. If they were to name a bar after you, what would you want to be in it? And what would you want it to be called? Sidle Rifle title, because I would recommend that. See, I almost feel like I I kind of want it to be some sort of like donut pun. Though I don't know how we do a donut like flavored bar. Donut go keto. Donut. Yeah, donut go keto. I donut talk to don- me on planes. Yeah. <laughs> donut give me running advice. Um, but yeah, like donut to- flavored. Yeah, but like, what would a donut? Because there's so many different kinds of donuts. So I don't What's know. Maybe, maybe in the chat, if anybody's got some good ideas, what like a cidal themed bar would be. Oh, Boston it, Cream. Oh, that's, that's a fun cream. one. Oh, Sarah Conklin said Boston Cream. She works for Picky Bar, so maybe this is gonna happen. Apple cidal. Wait, that's so oh. good. Okay, apple cidal is actually my sister's uh, food Instagram account, but I would totally like mm. an apple cider donut flavored bar apple would cidal? be incredible. Like that a is so good. one. Oh, Sarah, can we please get this going? <laughs> yeah, she's probably already on it. She's great. She's going to make this happen. She'll have samples to you tomorrow. Um, okay, so lining up at the start, you have this moment of like, the gun's going to go off. I'm going to be an Olympian. Did you have a race plan or at a race like this, <laughs> do plans go out? To- okay, great. Elaborate. I never have race plans, please. <laughs> no, I, I legitimately actually, so I, this is kind of a thing with me. I, I don't make race plans because at the end of the day, I believe the universe is chaos and there is no point of making plans because all of your plans will go to hell in a handbasket. So how I approach races is that I, I, I like to be prepared for different options to happen and almost like keep an open mind and just kind of stay in the moment. So like, it's a, I don't know. I almost go into like this weird, like alter ego when I race where it's like a much more like Zen slash bitchy version of myself. Um, yeah, it's like, it's like mean Molly. Like I am, I will say straight out right now. I am not nice when I race. Like I'm very friendly in real life. I am horrible when I race. Like I wait, will, but what do you I, mean? Like to your competitors? Are you like cat? Are you like trash talking them on the no, run, I'm or not, like in your head? I'm not trash talking, but like I guess in the way, like in my normal life, I'm very like I'm a Midwesterner at my core. Like I apologize for everything. I'm very deferential to people. I like will always. I sorry is my favorite word. When I am racing, like, and I think my college coach instilled this in me, like, I'm a goddamn shark. Like, I will, my college coach, when I was, like, before nationals in college, he, like, comes up to me, he's like, Molly, these bitches aren't your friends. And I'm like, damn straight. Yeah, so that's kind of the approach that I take of, like, okay, like, I'm about to go cut a bitch. Like, (laughs) it's not necessarily the best thing to say, but... I feel like it helps me get into the mindset that I need to when I race. I now everybody's going to think I'm even more of a psychopath um, than I already explained. Um, But basically like, so when I go into races, I'm very like, kind of like stay in the moment, react to moves as they happen. um, And definitely like race much more aggressively than I would in like my normal life, I guess. Like normal Molly would not necessarily be brave enough to go out with the two world record holders, but race Molly is like, oh yeah, hell yeah, I can run with them. And so it's, I guess it's just like a different mindset that like flips once I'm in the race. I love that. I also Mm -hmm. like that someone is singing Molly shark (laughs) dude, 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 (laughs) dude. (laughs) <laughs> it's gonna be in my head for the rest of the night but that's good um what about with you sally and alephine it seems like the three of you do have a really sweet bond that's mm-hmm. been fun to watch especially um i know sally was of course away for a lot of training and a lot of this time mm-hmm. but it seems like you and alephine developed a really lovely friendship and that might have been there before the trials but mm-hmm. you know team usa feels 
feels like something good to bond over. Yeah. Did the three of you say anything? It, it really seemed like you and Sally, especially were working together mm-hmm. quite a bit. Um, you look around so much when you run. Do you know you do that? You are like looking, looking. Wait, really? Um, yeah. I mean, I don't I know. I don't even know that. I feel like you like look around quite a bit. And it, at times it looked like you were maybe looking for Sally. Like, where is she? I mean, these are the stories we mm-hmm. make up in our heads. We watch these races for two hours at home. You know, we got to, yeah. we need an internal dialogue of our own. Uh, mm-hmm. So for you though, what, what was going through your head? Did you have a plan to work together at all? Yeah. So going into the race, we definitely approached that race with like a team mindset of like, cause Alphine and I had been working out together going into that. Um, cause we're both, um, based out of Flagstaff, Sally, she had been back in Kenya, but like, I've got a great relationship with Sally. Like she is legitimately one of the funniest people I know. Like I've known her since I was in college. She is just like, she's been one of my idols since I was like 19 years old. And like, I don't know. I love that woman. So going into the race, we, we'd been like running together all week, working out together, knowing that we really wanted to work together. Um, and Alphine had let us know that her hip was really bothering her. Um, and so we were just trying to support her in any way possible, but she knew that she might not be able to finish the race. And so she was being very realistic with it. Um, so Sally and I were then like making race plans of like, okay, how are we going to be able to support each other in this race? What do we think the pace is going to go out at? And then once we got into the race, it just was a very natural thing to be wanting to like work together of like, I'll grab the bottle. She grabs the ice and trade off because it's like, I don't know. I feel like, especially with that it's like when you have these people that you really care deeply about and like I approached that race of like okay we are team USA at the end of the day I know that we qualify as individuals but like we're we're here together and if we can support each other in that that we're going to like come through this the best possible way so it was really cool to get to have that of like someone that I like look up to so much to have right there with me in the race, like that made me actually feel much more comfortable up at the front, having Sally right there with me of like, okay, like we're in this together. (laughs) We're going to die together if we're going out too fast. Um, but yeah, it like, it's very calming and just being able to have that of like a friend right next to you. Like, I mean, it's terrifying leading the Olympic marathon. And like, if you have like someone that you deeply care about right there next to you. It's like, makes it that much easier. Oh, mm. warm fuzzies. Yeah. But Sa- like Sally Diego is one of my favorite people. I feel like, I feel like Alphine and I get a lot of like press and a lot of people focus on us and in, in social media and in the running world. But Sally is lovely and just straight up so funny. More people need to like pay attention to Sally. Also, she's a goddamn legend. When I would work bottles for her when I was in college, I was just like living out here in Flag and I would do some of her bottles down in Camp Verde when she was training for New York Marathon. Oh my God. She's just like a goddamn legend. She is so cool. That's awesome. How cool too to get to then be on the team with her and working mm-hmm. together and knowing that as much as you were looking out for her, she was looking out for you. That's pretty, pretty darn special. It looked like there was quite a bit of talking happening throughout the race. Um, not just between you and Sally, between everyone. Um, Mm -hmm. is that accurate or is that just, again, us watching at home being like, looks like someone said something. Is there Uh, much chatter? There's talking, there's trash talking. There are people. people. Oh yeah. The, (laughs) oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so, yeah, Wait, from Mean actually, Molly or like at Mean Molly? No, so I I don't try. Like I defend my ground. I'm not like outwardly aggressive. I guess Mean Molly is just more assertive Molly, I guess is the right word. I'm not like outright going to go after people. However, if someone had gone after Sally, I would have gone after them. Like I will be an enforcer. I don't start fights. Um, however... I was being targeted by quite a few people in that race, which is, I will clear this up right now. The reason why I was like veering away from the pack was not because I was trying to get in the shade. It was because I was literally being like elbowed and shouldered and knocked around. And I was just trying to get away from people. And I was like being yelled at by some of the Kenyans. So I will clear that up right now. (laughs) Wow. Give me a minute. Um, and so you just 
move to the side or like, I don't know. So I, don't I was know trying if I can... to stay clear. So in How the does way that family and I work together, the Kenyans work together as well. And like, it just blows my mind that they were able to push me around as much as they could, because like, I've got a solid, like 20 pounds of muscle on each of those women. And so I, I feel like if I wanted to, I definitely could have like gotten them, but yeah, it was, I was getting like knocked around quite a bit. Wow. Did that get in your head at all? That would get in my, that would get in my head. I say like I would ever be in that scenario. Um, but I mean, how did you maintain composure? And yeah, um, someone asked, how did you know that it was directed at you? Uh, because Saul Peter literally yelled at me in the middle of the race. <laughs> yeah. She veered from one side of the race course to the other and shouldered into me what? and said, I can't remember exactly what it was, but she said, if you want to run up front, you have to be ready to run up front. And I was like, okay. (laughs) It was like, yeah. And I just saw there. It's a shocking amount of drama that goes on in those races. It's like really high emotions. And like, I kind of just like, just go with it. And I was like, of course they don't want me up here. Like they probably like, like, who the hell is this girl? And so like, yeah, I, they probably thought I was just trying to like, hang on for dear life, which I was. Um, and yeah, they were probably like, what is she doing up here? Because I was being fairly aggressive with my racing. Like I was pushing a little bit, I was making moves. And so they were probably like, okay. This, pushing the pace this, or pushing people? So as no pushing the pace as, <laughs> as we were coming around the curves. And so they were probably like, okay, who the hell is this girl? Wow. Did you know that going into this, like that, that is a thing that happens. Did anyone warn you about that saying like, Hey, you get really, Oh yeah. It happens in most professional. I have done 400 episodes of my podcast and no one has ever told me these stories. Wait, really? Yeah. Yeah. No, there's like, yeah, no thing. And that's the thing is like, at the end of the day, like I like Paris and Bridget, like they are such nice women. Like after the race, we were like hugging. They're so nice. We talk, but like, when you're in the race and this happens with pretty much any professional race, like things get pretty freaking real. Like, wow. yeah. Like I have, I have minced words with people that I am like very close to, but like, yeah, it gets real in the race course. It's high emotions. Wow. I think I'm just surprised to hear it in the marathon. Um, you know, we see it on the track. We see some shoving and jostling on the track. Um, mm-hmm. but it, it does surprise me. Maybe I'm just very naive. Um, and it surprises me to hear that about, the I marathon. think it's just- the marathon is such a longer event. It's a, like the track, it's so condensed. And with the mile, it's so intense that like you see everything that's happening. Whereas with the marathon, you might miss some of the stuff that's going on, but yeah, there's like little power plays. I loved with how like the men's marathon, I don't know. I feel like a lot of people saw this of, um, Galen Rupp was clipping Elliot Kipchoge. Kipchoge. <laughs> yeah. On his feet. And Elliot like literally turned back to him and he was like, if you want to lead, you go. And Gail, I was like, no. And that's when Elliot took off. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's these little pieces of drama. It's like, it is kind of funny when it happens, but yeah, I guess there's more. um, Yeah. It's a little bit cattier than you would assume. Wow. I like the The real housewives of Sapporo. Real Real housewives housewives of Sapporo. Sapporo. Um, I like the person in here. It was uh, Eve said, you need a, sorry for what I said at mile 20 tank top. (laughs) I like that. <laughs> That's actually pretty good. You could sell that with the picky bars that are going to have your name and pick on them. Um, okay. So this is all happening in the race. At what point, you know, we saw that sexy move of you with the ice going down. Oh, that was amazing. Um, I love that you reposted it in slow-mo. That was great. Uh, but when did it start to feel either like unbearably hot or hard or fast? Or at, was there a point when you questioned whether you could hang on so we were going into that final lap so like six miles to go or so we're hitting mile 20 and it's starting to get hot um and I'm still feeling pretty okay um but so Mike Smith um Galen's coach my friend he was our, all of our coaches were working the bottle stations because we had like your specific country had your bottle stations so he was at the mile 20 bottle station um I I saw him and he's yelling to me he's like the move's going to happen. You have to be ready. And right after that is when the women started moving. And I was feeling it in my legs at that point. I'd been racing pretty aggressively. 
And I, I felt them starting to pull away and I saw John with about three miles to go. And he just screams like rule five at me, which is just like our, our catchphrase for like, basically like harden the fuck up. Um, pardon my French, but yeah, once Bridget, I knew that the break was coming and I knew that when it happened, I wasn't going to be able to stay with Paris and Bridget, um, just because they are, they're class above everybody else in the world. Um, my hope was to stay with Saltpeter and to stay within range of third. Um, so they started pulling away and that's when it was getting really hard. And at that point I was like, okay, I'm, I'm probably getting fourth. Like, I just don't know if I have what it takes to go with it. I can go the pace that I'm going right now. I don't reasonably think I can go much faster than this. Um, and I've just got to hang on and hope nobody behind me catches me. And so I was going with like everything that I had, just hoping that I could hold on. And all of a sudden, Saul Peter starts coming back to me and I'm like, oh my God, what's happening right now? And then all of a sudden she's just gone out of like the back of my vision. And I thought that like, I didn't know what happened. I thought she might just be tailing off of me and like waiting for that final finish. And so I was like, okay, you just got to go as hard as you possibly can right now and just hope that she doesn't catch you. I did not know that she had started walking. And that was when it really started to hit of like, okay, like you could do this. Cause I had been, yeah, I had been like pretty convinced that I was getting forth and I'd like kind of come to terms with those. Like you have raced as hard as you possibly could. All of these women are sub 220 marathoners. Like you've done all that you could, all you can do right now is just like run as hard as you can and just see where it shakes out. So yeah, it was, frankly, it was pretty crazy once Saul Peter went and then it was just like staying calm those last couple of miles of like, just stay focused. This is so hard. It is so hot. You just need to like keep moving. So I actually don't remember from watching and because obviously the cameras, um, you know, the broadcast was kind of tough um, Mm -hmm. for that one um, since most of the broadcasters weren't there. They were doing a remote broadcast. Um, Were you turning around much? Did you look behind you or like, were you worried that anyone was behind you? What did you know? So I actually have kind of a thing that I don't look behind me when I run. Um, I feel like it, one, it's just because my mom is very, my mom is not a runner. My mom knows nothing about running. But the one thing she always insists on is don't look back. And so I feel like I kind of hold to that. Um, And I feel like it helps my presence of mind of just like, if you just assume that everyone is always directly behind you, you're going to run a lot faster. Um, So yeah, I I did not look back at all those last couple of miles. So I had no idea until I came past at mile, I want to say it was 20 five or so and so Mike was then shouting again to me he's like you've got 40 seconds on the field and that's when I was like oh my god like yeah so that was about a mile to go and it was just like oh my god this is happening okay so bring us to the moment that we all saw and like not a dry eye around the world or at least in the U.S. um we can speak to that um you coming in did you say like all right if I am about to get the bronze, I'm going to scream or I'm going to like have a move. Okay. So that was no. just like pure. That was just raw emotion. Like that was coming down those final hundred meters. And I just like, I did not, it was just like, I didn't even have like conscious thoughts at that point. I was just like, it was just like every emotion in my body just came out. I was so excited. And yeah, that was the only thing I could do. I, I think if I had more presence of mind, I would have done something more like, oh, oh, it was amazing. Or not. Yeah, I was just like, that was just pure 100% emotion, just screaming. Well, and that was what did it. And I've talked to so many people that it was like, hearing that from you is what just like, it was game over. Um, <laughs> it was a lot of tears uh, for many of us in our living rooms. Will Don't you- worry, I cried like three times in the mix zone. I was like, yeah, I was a blast box of emotion. Will you recreate that moment for us right now? The, the, the screaming. finish line scream. Yeah. I want to hear it again. Do you want like the full, yeah. I see, I don't know if I even can. I feel like it was just like such an in the let's, moment. Let's thing. see what happens. Ah! 
See, I feel like it's not even like, it needs just like that sheer like amazement and also panic. Like, okay. So you cross the finish line. What do you remember? I can't even comprehend the emotions that must have been just going through your whole body and your mind. What do you remember most when you think about crossing that finish line and becoming an Olympic bronze medalist? I mean, number one, this is going to sound so bad, but like relief that you get to stop running um, is always number one. You're like, oh, thank God. Um, But then just like, I don't know. It was this feeling of like, it didn't hit for like, a hot minute you're just like you're there and you're like whoa like what just happened and then so Tyler our team coordinator um who is just like he is just a goddamn champion he had been working so hard all week he was so stressed he showed he's there at the finish line and he's got the flag because your team has to supply the flag that you wear and he's bawling and he's like he's like put the flag on and so I just start bawling as well and like yeah it was that's when it hit of just like oh my god oh my god like this just happened and then it was just like basically they gave me a minute to like catch my breath and then it was just like media cameras like everything um I took my shoes off um and then it was just like boom, like go through, I go through the mix zone and somebody pulls up on a phone, my family back in Wisconsin. And then that's like round two for tears. So I like getting to talk to them was just like incredible. I was just, yeah, a hot mess. We're going through the mix zone still. And so my coach, John, who he's my best friend, he had been across the course of the bottle station. He couldn't be at the finish because you had to bust back and it was like full quarantine. Wow. And so probably about 10 minutes after I finished, he finally gets there and he is sprinting in. And that was round three of tears as I just like break down again, because he's been like, we've been like such a team through this. He's been with me from like literally the lowest moment of my running career to like now just this incredible high. So it was, yeah, that, that time in that like finish line area was just so many tears, so many tears. Well, I wondered, so when you did that one interview um, with NBC and they had your family on FaceTime, did you realize right away that it was live? No, no. Okay, I wondered, cause it almost seemed like, and then all of a sudden you sort of started talking. So um, tell us about that moment. And, and you know what, for everyone watching, we do have to do like an official cheers because you said, have a beer for me. Drink a beer for um, me. So officially cheers to you. Uh, but so you didn't realize right away that like he had your family in his hands live. No, I did not realize that right away. I thought it, like it was a video or something at first. And then I was like, oh my God, it's like literally all them. And then I was like, why is everybody wet? <laughs> um, but because apparently it had been like a Raining. massive like thunderstorm. Yeah. And so they were all soaking wet. I thought they had jumped in the lake or something because we I grew up on a lake. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was like, and that's when like, I realized that it was like live talking to them that that's, I just lost it. Cause like, it was frankly really hard not getting to have them there in like in Japan. And so like being able to see them right after and like, know that they'd been watching the whole time, like that really meant a lot. Okay. So once you get through the mix zone, you finally get to change clothes, put on something dry, hopefully cool maybe have a snack, whatever you were up for. What was it like when you turned your phone on? Like, have you gotten, the, I mean, I can't even imagine. Okay. Tell us. I'm that. just going to, any notifications? I'm going to apologize right now for anyone watching this. If you have texted me in the last month, if I haven't responded, I still have approximately 788 unread text messages on my phone it's, I'm never going to recover from this. Um, it's the, it's the best kind of problem to have, but yeah, it was just like, it was wild. It was wild. The text messages, everyone I've ever known, every ex-boyfriend I've ever had texted me. So, oh. um, also the other wild thing 
was people just started Venmoing me for beer money, which was crazy. Cool. So that was super fun. So thank you, people of America. What's your Venmo? The- we can do that. Uh, it's at Full Send Project. Of course it is. Um, but yeah, that was incredible. So anyone who Venmo- Type it in the chat. Just all thank one you. word. All full, one word, Full, full send, send Project, because we were using that Venmo to do the hat orders. Um, yeah, it was wild. It was incredible. Um, so yeah, that I'm was knowing you right now. It, that was super crazy. Um, but yeah, the whole thing was just wild. If anything, just like getting to finally then like actually call my family and talk to them. And then like my college coach and like my best friend who lives back in New York, like even like one of my best friends who lives here in Flagstaff, she called me at like 2 a.m. then. And I, like, of course, I did not sleep that night. So I'm like in bed, like all excited. I'm like, I just went abroad. And it's like 2 a.m. First ring phone goes. I'm like, boom, like answer that. Uh, she's like, why are you up? I'm like, girl, you think I'm sleeping? Like, <laughs> yeah. So it was just like that whole day was crazy. And then when did you head back to Tokyo the next day? Yeah. So we headed back the next morning. So we like, we kind of like low key partied that night. We were all pretty trashed because we also had just like run a marathon in like 90 degree heat. So we weren't feeling great. Um, but we did still have like a party in the hotel. And so then we flew back first thing the next morning down to Tokyo. They did not tell us that our medal ceremony was going to be in the middle of closing ceremonies. They told us that it would be kind of around them so we figured it was either going to be on the front end or the back end kind of just like a low-key thing so I'm in my cute little closing ceremonies outfit and John thanks again to bring my metal stand outfit and we go in and they pull me away from Team USA they're like oh you're not going to walk with Team USA I'm like oh that's kind of a bummer like I really wanted to walk with Team USA why do I have to wait back here they're like oh no you're going on in the middle of the ceremony I'm like what and so that was crazy and I think I literally pulled like five muscles in my face from smiling so hard that, that picture of you incredible is amazing it's like the, I've never seen a smile so big and joyful it's awesome that was like just like the most genuine like happiest moment I think I felt of just like yeah you're just like at the closing ceremonies in front of everyone and just like get your medal I'm just like this is the greatest moment of my life (laughs) um wait I do want to go back when you said that the night in Sapporo that you were pretty trash what is drunk Molly like are you chatty are you silly are you like quiet in the corner no so drunk Molly I just so truly drunk Molly I was like mildly drunk Molly that night so I'm just like very friendly. I start turning into my mom. So I'm like party girl, truly drunk. Molly just wants to race people. Like this is a persistent problem. When I get like truly properly drunk, I start racing people like in the streets, like one of my best friends, bachelorette parties. I was like racing people in heels on the streets of Manhattan. Like it's a real problem. Like I'm a runner when I get real drunk. So it's good that we didn't get to that point. This is the most I've ever related to you, Molly. Um, Because same, only slower, but same. Put a couple drinks in me. I suddenly think I'm an Olympian. In college, we used to go out to the bars and I used to run home alongside my friend's cars. I would run home from the bars. We are the same person. We are the same person. That's like my key move. I hate taking Ubers home from bars. When I'm really drunk, I just run home. Heels, no problem. (laughs) <laughs> and usually I would have a cup of French fries too. Cause I would need snacks. Okay. I think the moral of this is that we just need to get properly drunk together. And then I don't want like to race drunk, you run home. I no, we won't race. We'll okay. Just like run home. Then yes. It'll be a fun run home. See you in New York. Me, you and Callum. Let's have a good time. Callum, please. I'm Come in. Drunk, um, run <laughs> okay. Will the medal make an appearance in this year's Seidel family holiday card. Have we talked about this? Have you talked to aesthetics, photographer? I'm sure. Will it just be you on the family photo card? Oh God, I hope not. I, because that's the thing. At the end of the day, I, like, I don't love all the attention that comes with this. Like, I feel very weird about it. So like, I'm sure Anne will find some way to introduce that into the, the, the only solace that I can take in this is that our holiday family card 
always comes out like three months late. So people might forget about it by then. Like legitimately, it always comes out around Valentine's Day. Like my mom is Valentine's Day Valentine's Day cards because she never gets them out by Christmas. This is just a a persistent problem with our family. Um, But yeah, I'm sure I will convince my mom to make a small thing in the corner. It will not be the preeminent thing because does she do a letter like like, what's new with the citals yeah (laughs) well I'm sure I'm sure like Izzy would be very mad about it too if I got more space on the card that she did because it all has to be like equally distributed also Izzy makes the card so this is all up to her Mm -hmm. she's good though she's funny I mean, you're all, she's funny, very like, funny. She'll find a good way to do it. I'm, I'm also hoping- surprised though, that with Izzy in charge of it, it goes out late. Cause she's very like, I feel like she's very, yeah. Funny. But at the end of the day, it's about my mom ordering it. So the problem is my mom only starts to plan it once we all come home for Christmas and designing the card on December 24th is not going to get that thing out by Christmas time. Fair. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, if Anne is here, um, something to start thinking about. I don't know if she got the zoom link, but, um, you know, it, at this point it's, it keeps getting later every year. So it's going to be a St. Patrick's St. Patty's day. day. Yeah. Hey, beer. Let's go. <laughs> you know? Um, okay. So we talked about how you're running New York. Have you mm-hmm. thought yet about what that will look like? Is it, and I've, I've read interviews. So I do feel like I know the answer to this mm-hmm. question. Is it a victory lap or is it a uh, Molly shark? Do, 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 do. No, it, it, this is going to be a Molly Shark type situation. I feel like um, me doing New York, partially why I chose New York is because it was going to give me the most time after the Olympics to like prepare again. I get pretty much 10 solid weeks of training. So I really wanted to go to, into it with like the mentality of like, okay, like I'm racing this. This is not just going to be like having fun after the Olympics. Like if I show up to a major marathon, I want to be there to like race, race. Awesome. So, um, is it safe to assume that you're feeling pretty confident right now after this? Um, I like, it's weird. Like I, how I look at this medal is like, it's really cool that it happened, but at the same time, like, I don't, I don't know. This is, I guess this is going to sound weird, but I guess I don't ever look at these accomplishments as like, as being better than someone else. I just look at it as like, wow, like I had a really good day on that day. And like, if it had been held a day before or a day after it could have gone completely differently. So I'm like, this is a cool like accomplishment. And I feel like it helps validate, like it helps give me a little bit more confidence in what I'm doing. But at the same time, I'm not going to be like, oh yeah, I'm the fucking best. Like, it's like, sorry to be swearing on this, but, um, yeah, Yeah, I guess here it's 9 PM. You're good. Yeah. But I guess like, if anything, yeah, it gives me more confidence in what I'm doing because I really do struggle with like self-confidence in this sport, especially as a newer marathoner. Um, but yeah, it doesn't make me think I'm a big shot by any means. I can go and get my ass kicked six ways to Sunday by any one of the women in that field. So it's like, (laughs) if anything, like I know that like, I have to like, even more so than before, I got to be ready to show up to like any race that I go to, because it's like, just because I don't have, or just because I have a medal doesn't mean like it makes it any easier. Like people are coming for me regardless. So yeah, if we could just go back to, um, the chatter that we were mentioning, and then I swear I'm going to move on from that, but I'm mm-hmm. a little fascinated. Um, did you talk to each other afterward? Like, um, Sal Peter, mm-hmm. after she finished, was she like, Hey, good game. Good game. You know, like that's what af- like ball sports athletes do is they like rip each other apart on the field or the mound or whatever. And then they shake hands. Good game. Good game. Good game. So we, we did not talk right after the marathon. Um, just because we, so Sal Peter finished a ways back because she did start walking. So I believe she finished in about 60. We did meet up at closing ceremonies. It was a very interesting conversation because at first she was like, at first, I was very mad at you and I hated you, but now I'm okay with you. And you did a, you ran very well, but I will come for you. I'm like, Oh shit. Like, it was a really interesting conversation. I appreciate her being very blunt though. She was very nice about it. And I'm like, okay, I respect the hell out of that. Like, wow. These I'm stories like, are fun. Like, you will come for me. You're like a 217 marathon. Yeah. 
I love this is like the alley on the run show after dark and I am here for it. Um, I know exactly. I was like the hot <laughs> drama in marathoning. Everybody thinks we're so nice. I do think you're nice. I think you're fun. I think everyone thinks <laughs> Thank you're you. fun. That's Thank for you. sure. Um, <laughs> Other so, than Molly Shark. <laughs> did you ever watch the race in full? Have you watched the coverage? I have not actually seen any of the race oh, yet. I'm going, it was great. I, everybody's really telling me that, but I, watching races of myself is kind of like hearing a recording of my voice where it's kind of weird. Like this is, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm going to want to like watch it with friends if anything, but I've heard Kara Goucher's announcing was incredible. It was great. So I really, really want to hear that. Also, yeah. I'm going to duck out of the frame real quickly while I plug in my iPad just so I don't. So you yeah, can keep reading that. Atlas Shrugged when this is So I can through. keep Avery. Yeah. So actually, so I can watch Netflix after this is over. Um, I just die on you guys. Well, we are going to wrap this up soon. We're going to have a fun sprint to the finish round. But I do want to know um, that little piece of paper that was everywhere with little Molly saying, when I grow up, I want to win a gold medal in the Olympics. Uh, um I want to know more about that. How was it so readily available? Like, is it on the Seidel fridge? Where is it now? Who is it? Like, does Izzy have it? Do you have it? Is it, where is that? What's the story? Well, my mom, this is going to sound really weird. It makes sense in the Seidel family, but it's in a cabinet in the pantry framed. And it's been there for years. I don't know why it's in the pantry. We just have a weird amount of things in there. Um, but yes, it's in a little framed thing in our pantry and yeah, so it is fairly readily available in the Seidel household. I guess my mom just thought it was really cute. Um, cause it's got like, I just kind of decorated it like on a whim when I was like in like 10 years old, I'm like, ah, I'd like to go to the Olympics and win a medal. I'm like, Oh, my mom's like, okay, cool, Molly. Thanks. I'll put this up. It's got little sombreros and like little drawings on it. I mean, obviously. Um, yeah, obviously, as one does. Um, but yeah, my mom just put it in a frame, put it in the pantry, and it's just sat there for years. And so, yeah, I guess now once all this has kind of come about, it's gained a lot of fame. Um, I just think it's funny that, yeah, everyone's like focusing on this. And if anything, a really disappointed fourth grade Molly of only getting bronze and not getting gold. Oh, she <laughs> so, yeah, we gotta, we gotta really try for that one next time. Wait, around. but also you were talking about trying to find somewhere clever and like kind of weird to put your medal in your place now. Maybe Ooh. frame in your pantry. Maybe we should frame it in the pantry. Maybe that's a new tradition. Really right next to the rice aroni. That would be so appropriate. I love this for you and your house <laughs> guests. Uh, okay. So before we get into our sprint to the finish, um, I do always like to ask people as of today, cause we know mm -hmm. these change, what are your biggest hopes, dreams, and goals on the run and beyond? Ooh, as of like, as of right now, right this second, right this second. Ooh. So I guess my biggest, like as of right now, I'm, so I'm racing Great North Run half marathon in two weeks out in England. So I guess my big hope would be like, I really would like to go out there and run well, I guess in the immediate future and run well in New York. But yeah, I think like in terms of like long-term try and qualify for the 2024 team as well. Um, and next year for world champs, I definitely intend to try and run the, um, the world champs marathon in Eugene. So yeah, I think that's going to be a big goal of mine over the next year to really focus on that. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll see where that goes, but yeah, if anything, like I'm just really enjoying getting to like get back to training right now. Like at the, like this has all been super fun and I'm trying to like enjoy it for what it is, but like at the end of the day, I'm just a huge freaking running nerd and I just really enjoy training and I just want to get back to like marathon training. <laughs> I love it. All right. Are you up for a little sprint to the finish round? I know I've put you through this. Let's before, go. But, um, the but the last time you better. did it, it was with Izzy. You had a teammate for that one. So now I know, but I feel, I feel like I can operate pretty well independently. Okay, great. Let's see. Mm -hmm. um, what is your favorite way to get psyched before a race? Ooh, I listen to gangster rap music, but like 90s, 90s gangster rap, like NWA. <laughs> wow. Favorite TV show? Favorite TV show, 30 Rock. Favorite movie? Across the Universe. Oh, wow. I forgot about that movie. I, I, I used to cry that, that soundtrack in the shower. I love, I love the Beatles, a Beatles rock opera. Just like, mm, 
Perfect. Also, I the have not thought though. about that. Wow. I have not thought about that in a long time. Yeah, see, now you're sad showers. Mm-hmm. Favorite marathon specific workout. Ooh, I love float and push miles. So we basically, you average out marathon pace for like 12 miles, but it'll be a mile at 10 seconds faster than marathon pace. And then a mile, 10 seconds slower than marathon pace. And we do that up in Flagstaff on Lake Mary. It is so hard, but so good. And it, it's just really good to practice that change in pace throughout the marathon. Sounds fun. Let's do that. Mm-hmm. Let's do, yeah. let's do that on our way home from the bar. That'll be yeah, good. Exactly. That'll, that'll be great for us. Describe yourself as a runner in one word. Mm. Oh, <laughs> God, <laughs> this is actually really hard. I know. Um, unconventional. Ooh, describe yourself off the run in one word. Weird. <laughs> Who is a runner that you would love to see on Dancing with the Stars? On Dancing with the Stars? Oh, great. Emma show. Coburn. I feel like she would be really good. She would be really good. She'd yeah. probably win. Would you do Dancing with the Stars if they approached you? Okay, I actually loved Dancing with the Stars when I was a kid. So 100%. I used to your partner to be little. Hmm? Well, let's wear our tap shoes to the bar then for sure. See, but I know ballroom dancing is very different from tap dancing. So I know it wouldn't necessarily like transfer over. You could do so you think you can dance if you'd rather. They have no, I, I'd love to be with like Derek Huff. Like, oh yeah. The dream. Do you follow him on Instagram? He's so creative. No, I don't. I should. He's oh. so, he is a beautiful man. Yeah. He oh. tells a lot of really funny jokes and he's so creative and he's so like sensual. Sometimes he's sensual with his sister, which I'm not sure how I feel about that. Yeah. Um, kind of like, Ugh. But if you can just separate those things and like Julianne is beautiful. So it's like, they're too beautiful. Yeah. I don't know. But it's still got a little like <laughs> Lannister thing going on there. Yeah, it's yeah. like, Ooh. um, what is a job that you would suck at? A job that I would suck at. Oh, um, I feel like I would be a really bad car salesperson. I would just cave instantly <laughs> to any sort of negotiation. It's free. Yeah. Just you take Oprah. it, please. Don't you get a me. car. You get a car. What is your go-to karaoke song? Oh, Brandy by Looking Glass. Wow, you were ready with that one. Mm-hmm. What is your greatest little fear? Not, not like a big thing like death, but like little fear. <laughs> So I am actually low-key terrified of, you know, when people dress up in the big costumes, it's like mascots. We're the terrified. same. I think we're the same person there. You don't know who's in there. They're weird. It's they, weird. The eyes don't change. I don't like it. I don't like the hands. I don't like any part about What about it. when Just, you can no. see their face through the screen? No, the screen. I went to Disney World once and it was horrifying. I'm just dying because I can see in the chat that David Feller is here and that is my dad. And I know that my parents are sitting at their house being like, Allison's afraid of that too. Cause they use my full name. Um, wow, 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 wow. Did you, okay. Can I ask you where the genesis for that fear came from? Do you remember? Um, yes, I do remember exactly where it came from. Uh, if there are any Wisconsinites in the chat, um, you might know of the Piggly Wiggly chain of grocery stores in Wisconsin. And Mr. Piggly Wiggly is a giant pig mascot that comes out every 4th of July at the parade. He's got a big pig head, big round body, absolutely horrifying. It haunts my nightmares to this day. Well, I am here to add to that. MTV, true life, I'm a furry. Scarred me for life. <laughs> I saw it in like seventh grade and I did not like what I saw. And so anyway, <laughs> Google it. Okay. We've covered okay. Derek Huff oh. incest, furries. This yeah. conversation has been People exactly are going to be watching for. this. Like what did we sign up for? Watching the attendees just, I don't know. It's getting late. It's getting weird. What was your first screen name? My first screen name, I still actually use it to this day. Jetty126. What is that? It's, it's, so my nickname in middle school was Jetty. Um, but basically I've used it for every email that I've ever had. So people to this day are like, 
why is your email je- like jetty? I didn't want to I- say that because I didn't want to give away part of your email, but I have always wondered why that is your email address. No. So it was in fifth grade. We ran the mile in gym class and basically, so I ran the school record in fifth grade and the gym teacher was like, you ran that like you had jets in your pants. And because middle schoolers are the worst, yeah. I was then called jet ass for all of middle school. But <laughs> my friends then just appropriated that to just calling me jetty That's for cute. like several years. <laughs> jet ass. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. For fun when you're 12. So fun. Who was your childhood celebrity crush? Nick Jonas. Oh, his hair. The burning up music video. Really good. Really good. If you could take a class in anything, what would it be? Oh, as I'm like just starting up classes again. So I'm getting my MBA. So I'm like, you are right. Oh yeah. Wait, that's awesome. Yeah. It's nice to have something else to do during the day. That's so cool. But yeah, I guess if I could take a class in anything. So I actually, I studied archaeology in college um, fun fact. And so I would like, my dream would be to go back and like get my PhD in archeology. span Do it. You could be like Ross Mm. Geller, paleontology. Well, so that's the thing. I did a lot of archeological digs in college, but there's a lot less like Indiana Jonesing than people would assume. It's a lot more like digging in holes and a lot fewer whips and fedoras, but it's okay. You could bring your own whip (laughs) and fedora. I just show up to this dig in Argentina, like, let's go. (laughs) Um, okay. Give everyone listening, everyone watching a reason to go for a run. Oh, cause it's fun as hell. Yeah. Agreed. Um, okay. Before I let you and everyone go, I do have some giveaway winners that I get to announce, which is so exciting. I should have sent this to you so you could do this. Um, okay. So we have Oh, you get to choose. Okay. I should have read this. Wait, I choose? Sarah. No, not you, oh, the winners. Like... You oh, can have okay. these things too, I'm sure. Just let the people at Piggy Bars know. I thought um, I was choosing the winners. I was like, that's a lot of pressure. Oh no, I have them in a text. Um, oh, okay. So no, Piggy Bars has chosen the winners and the winners get their choice of a full send bundle. Very appropriate for Molly, which includes every single picky food product. Choose that oh. one. Or you get an intro bundle, a Believe training journal, and a Coexist t-shirt, which is also cool. And those winners are Amanda Gross, Shayla Vorak, D-V-O-R-A-K, doing my best to say it right, and Casey Conway. Um, If you're here, congratulations. If you're not here, you aren't hearing this, but um, all three of them will be getting an email from Piggy Bars. Oh, Shayla said that's me. She's here. That's so great. Um, So congratulations to the three of you. Molly, seriously, I cannot thank you enough. Before I let you go, I'm going to take a screenshot. Tilt your head. I don't know on your screen. Yeah, that way. Lean in that way. And we're going to cheese. Got it. Um, Thank you everyone so much. This was such a fun Tuesday night. We're all going to one of these days hang out at a bar and race our way home. And it's just going to be the best ever. Molly, congratulations. You're such an inspiration. Thank you so much for doing this. It has been so much fun and we will all be cheering you on in New York and getting your MBA and your PhD and with your whips and your digs and all those things. So this has been awesome. Thank you everyone. And thank thank you you so much. Oh, thanks guys. Thanks for coming. Have a good night, everyone. I just want to stay and read the chat. I know. I want to go through all of these. (laughs) It's a lot about Callum. I know. (laughs) Come on. Does anybody know him? Can we, can we link this up? (laughs) We, I mean, we can. We, we certainly can. Um, all right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Molly. Bye, guys.